So, without any further ado, let's please welcome El Jefe, it's Chef that, Bert that, Miller. That, <laughs> I need those kind of things. I'm long in the business, so I have signed this a couple of times before. Thank you. Um, okay. First of all, uh, my name is Fernand Bula. I am born and raised in the. Uh, is this, uh, this is the picture. The right button. Yep. Oh. No. no it's the left button. Two times. The left button. There we go. I forgot to do the other important thing. Oh. There you go. There you go. Okay. Uh, this just happened to be uh, was an article that I wrote about me. There was an entrepreneur magazine founded here in Orlando, okay, eight years ago. I met this guy in Panera, he spent two hours before he started his magazine, and then he said, Would you like to be featured? And I said, Yes. So, but he did, very smart. He sent me all the questions, but I had to fill them all out. So, really, he really did not write anything about me. I wrote about myself. Okay, it was smart. It was very, very good. So, it came out great. I mean, he had a little, little bit of a little bit wrong. But this year is, uh, I founded my company in 2001, but I didn't work full time. I just worked off and on because I still was the chef in the school of the world. The American Atlanta website, I don't know, just some time to do so I did a little consulting to the computer, those kind of things, but not physically going there. Okay, let me start off. Here's where I come from, home sweet home, okay? Born and raised in Germany, that's my parents upstairs. This is, uh, this is my father, great guy, great sports star, great sports star in Germany for many, many years in the 30s. My mom, unfortunately, had a divorce, but it was a great divorce. They didn't fight, they didn't go to court, they didn't have lawyers, they just walked away. And I still had the luxury to see them every year for six months. I went to this big ass house of my grandfather, they had this huge house. And I just, I was the king, I just could never go wrong. I was the only kind son. So it was a great, great, great uh, experience for me, okay? My mother, wonderful woman. Now, I took this picture here for my apprenticeship years, after I went to high school here. And then I went to a coach at the vocational prep, I thought it was Fox Schule and then Grove Schule. Same thing like vocational schools you go here, you know, specialized in whatever you want to specialize in. And this year, this picture is 60 years, 62 years old. I took this when I was 14 years of age. You know, that was my apprenticeship years. I was the first year in this little hotel. This guy was the chef up here. When he came in early in the morning, I just want to bring this up, he looked like Sean Fronson. He was the same type. You got scared when you saw this guy, but he was the most kindest, most considerate guy you could ever have a chef, compared to all those other chefs I had later on. Because my apprenticeship years were like you know, Hell's, Hell's Kitchen. You watch Hell's Kitchen? That's how I was going. Okay, not at all, but in my apprenticeship years. You had no rights. You were safe. You had to do what they told you 20 percent. It was very, very different and very tough. The parents had to buy everything. Wife, knives, uniform, shoes. We got $20 uh, a, a month, $40 a second year, and $60 a third year. It was just giving you some help for bus fare, rain fare, you know, to pay, pay for the tickets. Uh, after I did my three years, culinary arts and science, I mean, I've been in the military for two years, to the army. It was a great, great experience. You know, learn a lot of things, discipline, and all that. A lot of things you can't use a lot of people on, okay? I was shocked sometimes how many things I had to learn how to put up. The first three months I lost 20 pounds. 20 pounds. But the food was great. It was not only the food, it was something wrong with me. I had to move faster. And I get back again in the ring like anybody else. So I lost 20 pounds, but it was great. My mother was happy when she saw me. You could have to take the train ride every weekend when I had weekends off to go back and see mom and dad because it was far away station. In front, directly across the street were American barracks. So I had great relationship with those American soldiers. But I always loved when I, when I, when I saw those guys that had that tight cup. You know? I mean, still until today, I cannot see this enough. This is classic, this looks just great. We let this thing hang down there. It's horrible, German military, they don't know, they don't know how to fight, they don't know how to get things done. But when you see an American military person, uniform, there's nobody out there in the world. They're 
so, so for me, that was always a quite great memory. They invited me to a table tennis tournament or something, but they didn't know I was playing with the German team. So I won the tournament. So they gave me this beautiful match, you know, with the logo, the barracks. I still have it. You know, it was really wonderful fun memory. I mean, it was great. So after, after my military service, I had this uh, drive, I wanted to leave the army, I wanted to go somewhere else, I wanted to do something. So I went to the Olympic Games in Mexico City. This should totally change my life, forever, because I met my wife. Here's my wife of, we uh, will have our 53rd anniversary, the 28th anniversary. She has been a vital, vital figure in my life. I can't, but my grandmother and my brother, of course, too. Mostly they were women that affected my life. They were the ones who really got me going. Not men, women. Okay, so all the women here, compliment to you guys. My aunts and my, 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 my grandparents, my grandmothers, my two grandmothers. He spoke nine languages in the family. One aunt was from Sweden, one aunt was from uh, Italy, my wife Mexican, my cousins were from Holland. They all spoke German, and they all spoke, mostly spoke English, of course. But it was just, for me, it was just normal. It was just nothing special. But now I live here in America, I realize what a great privilege it was, what a great advantage it was to be brought up in all those different nationalities. That's why inclusiveness is very, very important. Very, very important, because racism is a bigger story you know than anywhere. I mean, you have to be open-minded, you have to give everybody a fair shot. Hopefully, I did this in my profession as long as I was here. So um, then, after the Olympic Games, I went there. My grandmother was so nice and gave me some money so I could take it for the rest. And she did really a lot of great things for me. She shielded me. She was the greatest shielding that I had in my life. She always believed in me. I had my ups and downs like any young person, but I never had drugs. I never had no, always stayed away from this one. Until today, very seldom I bring alcohol because I believe your mind has to be clear. If you want to do business, you want to be accepted and recognized, and you have to be always ready to go. So this would be now, this is a, just a snapshot of my career, okay? That's just some hotels. I could go on and on and on and on and on. I was very, very privileged, the, the career I had, the people I met in my career. They supported me, helped me, they connected me. Starting with this in Mexico City, this hotel doesn't exist anymore. It got uh, destroyed with the earthquake. 85. This was one of the legendary hotels in Latin America of uh, the Hilton chain. There was the Caracas Hilton, there was the Cuba, the, the Havana Hilton, was the Mexico City. I had a privilege to work there. I met Conrad Hilton with his own family in this one Christmas. You know, then a couple of years later, you know, he died. But just to meet this guy, because he started it all. Before, you know, Kevin Johnson, before all the other guys, before Marriott. Conrad, he, was really the first one to start it all. Uh, I became COVID chef later on, 20, 25, 26 years of age, but for San Jose, Mexico. They only had 15 hotels, but for me, in this age, to become COVID chef already. It was, I was the first COVID chef with the company. Today, the, the, the company has over 200 hotels. Okay, they were very small in those days, with very good, classic good hotels. I uh, had to travel a lot throughout Mexico, met a lot of great people, it was very important. Also, I worked for the president of Mexico, Miguel Ademar. Many months we had, once or twice we had parties in his house. We talk about a house. It's so like Shaquille O'Neal. I mean, this kind of house, 20,000 square feet. I mean, it was on the, You were wondering where the money was gone. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's just a way that we have similar problems here in America. Just basically. So uh, then uh, from there, you know, I got a little bit cold feet, and I wanted to do something else, and then I got transferred to the Mitchell Hilton. What was the classic hotel? Mitchell Hilton was in 1972 Olympic Games in uh, München. In our hotel, we had Jesse Owens, we had Max Manning, we had uh, Every Brandage. Uh, that's so much fun of Every Brandage because it's a big deal. But he was the president of the International Olympic Committee for many, many years. There's a big, big history in this, this gentleman. But a wonderful experience. Also, met a lot of people stayed there for one year, went back to Mexico. Later on, worked for this gentleman, the Sondelanca. That was a boutique hotel owned by one Mexican 
gentleman who was essential in my life. He was supporting me and helping us. I lived there for five years. After those five years, I went to Cancun to the Hotel Presidente. Uh, and then my last job in Mexico, I worked there 10 years, was at the Acapulco Princess. The Acapulco Princess in those days were one of the great hotels in South America. Beautiful hotel. Still a gorgeous hotel, but in those days, I mean, it looked like a Mexican pyramid. Once taken, you know, I mean, now they have a thousand room, a little bit more than a thousand room. They added another wing to the hotel, it was just one wing. All the fabulous uh, parties and fabulous uh, different events we had there from all over the world. I mean, we met Henry Kissinger there, he, he was there. And then George Bush was there, he still was senator in those days, but he was running for the presidency. 79. So it was just magic times. Not, not all of them are magic people, but some of them are magic people. Yeah. So uh, on the right side, then the glorious years of the United States of America, I think it was kind of cool. My whole life changed. Uh, started with Marriott in San Antonio Riverwalk. Very nice hotel. The city, very cosmopolitan. Uh, 51% of Hispanics and the rest of them are. What Americans are guys like me. And it was very, very nice there. In the meantime, I went to, went to uh, management, Marriott, uh, introduction to management. Can you turn so the mic can pick you up here? Oh, okay, okay, okay. okay. Just this here? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I went uh, with Marriott, went there for four weeks to uh, corporate headquarters, fantastic, very organized company. And hands down, the civic business of health company in the world. Once a Marriott, always a Marriott. It's like once a German, always a German. Very resilient, okay? But Marriott, I'm telling you, if you have a chance to work with Marriott, go and work for Marriott. A wonderful company. Great people. Mr. Marriott is a hell of a guy. Loves people, works with people, and listens to people. That's the most important thing. So I spent 22 years with them, okay? And worked uh, four hotels. Did two openings, one in Cancun, one in Guadalajara. I stayed in each hotel six weeks. Because of my previous experience in Mexico, I spoke Spanish in the center there. And uh, uh, had a great, great time. Then I went to Hawaii. Hawaii, my favorite place, perhaps, of all the places. Not only because of the islands, because of the people. The people are just magnificent. They're, they're hospitable, they're there for you, they're helping, support you. So I spent five years in, in Hawaii, and then my big dream. The Marriott Salada World Center. I always wanted to open this hotel. I saw pictures years earlier about this place. For me, I was always big time. That's why I came to the States. The big time. In Germany, you cannot do this. Big time, big time. You know, here you do big time. You know? So this this hotel, I mean, for me, it's a jewel of all the hotels I've worked in. I mean, 5,000 people, 6,000 people. Uh, they did sometimes six, seven, eight million dollars in one in one month. The hotel did close to 300 million dollars in revenue. One hotel. There's nobody here now. I mean, now things have changed after COVID. And it's a bit of a bug and that. But this place, I'm telling you, uh, still for me, whenever I go there, here, there, I think my grandsons meet them and walk with them and show them. Opa worked there. Oh, who? You know, some people are still there and say hello to me. It's just a gratifying experience, you know. A lot of purveyors I still I still have to talk to. He's one of them here. Jim is sitting here and now he does something else. But I met him in a basketball court 30 years ago. Then he became my lobster warrior. He made the best lobsters in the world. Boston from the main lobster. Nothing better. Nothing better. So he's here, and I'm very happy to see you. Thanks for coming. Uh, Puerto Vallarta, I opened Puerto Vallarta, I went there six months, and uh, then I went to Gaylord Palm. Unfortunately, Gaylord Palm turned out to be not a great experience for me because I only for six months. I don't, perhaps they didn't like me, and I didn't like them. You know, something has to give. That's me. Nobody is not going anywhere. You know? But uh, that's just the way how it works, you know. There's nothing you can do against it. You move on. I mean, they move on, you move on. And perhaps one day they will say, he used to work for him. Wow. That just happened one day. And after this, I stayed there for six months, opened the hotel. Then uh, the Omni Champions League came. 
uh, spent the 70, 70 years for your experience. Very nice of that. Now, even more nicer. You go there now, they added another 180 rooms on. I think they will have over 1,000 rooms in front. They open up to the second wing, third wing. When they did some real great investing and uh, beautiful stuff they did there. It's a wonderful time, met great, great people. But this is just in a nutshell. I could add on so many other things right now, but we don't have the time. I mean, we have a certain amount of time. We have to do the things, and I want to stay with those, with those rules. Uh, in the middle, I'm very proud about those things here because it has nothing to do with the cooking. That's management. The cooking part is a given for me. I mean, I was trained, I was out of degrees. This year is not a given. You have to work for it. If you want to be successful financially, and you want to know how to manage people, you go to Carnegie, you go to Tom Peters, you go to Stephen Covey, you go to Kenneth Blanchard. You put in there too to France and Spain and Argentina, fantastic. I worked with Paul Bocuse and Roger Bechet in France for six weeks, eight weeks. And uh, I opened it, I opened it. You know, how they work and how they perceive business. How they have changed now from the old classic cuisine now, they have to be more modern, they have to be more open-minded. That's, that stuff doesn't work well anymore. You have to do different things. But the wonderful experiences there, and there are so many other little, little things. But uh, this is more or less in a nutshell uh, my career progression, okay? Now, this here is part of my, my company, okay? Uh, once again, I started in 2001, but I really started to work on this, I would say, 2011, the 2010. When I was free, and then I could do whatever I wanted to do. And then it really kicked in. Here's various things I do, consulting, super uh, supporting kitchen designs, assisting in uh, setups and uh, changing uh, SOPs, LSOPs, whatever you need. If I can help you, I'd be more than happy to do it. Um, this here is more or less the way how it works. When we go on a trip, let's say we went to Trinidad and Tobago. Six months earlier, they have contact with those people. Phone calls, emails. They tell us what they would like to see, what their needs are. Based on what they tell us, what their needs are, we come up with a training schedule. We let them know this is what we can do for you. And those are the results eventually after four weeks, after two weeks, after six weeks, whatever they decide to do. It starts here, up on arrival, uh, the first thing you do is to meet with the GM and be elected and chef. You sit down for an hour, talk it all over, emails, compare, and after you have this first contact with the with property management, you go on a walkthrough and do an assessment for two, three hours. Uh, talk to various kitchen leaders, to various restaurant chefs, restaurant managers, Find out what the status is based on the GM told you and the told you. And then you start to implement slowly but surely your, your, your work schedule. Uh, after the assessment, you post the training schedule. Because the training schedule is already decided, because based on what they told us, you post it in the location where you have the training, physical training on. You know, the, the, the Princess Hotel in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Cancun, for example, had 14 restaurants and 16 bars. That's one of them. So we had one the restaurant was closed, just open up at night. So throughout the day, we had the whole restaurant for us. We could have classes there. We also could physically enhance the cooking there. So this is, was always the central location where we posted the sketches. So when Andrews came in the next morning, 9 o'clock, they could see already what was going on. I will show you the sketches later on and all the training matters. Uh, once this is done, the first thing we start off regularly when we visit the hotel is we say so. Everybody gets certified in food handling. That's the most important thing. Let me, uh, let me tell you this. You know that you have the right when you go to a restaurant to ask for the certification if the hotel and the restaurant is certified? You can do this. When you say don't know what to tell you, then she called the health inspector. You can't ask her. Well, I tell you what, as things are going right now, you should. You get sick left and right, everywhere. You know? So you have, you're entitled to do this, okay? 
And the house inspector comes, I have to talk about this because it's very, very dear to my heart because I'm a, I'm a food professional for so long. I'm certified left and right every year. Uh, the, the, the most important thing is safe food handling. I don't care what kind of chef you are, I don't care what gold medals you want in the Olympics. Doesn't matter. If the people get sick in your joint, they never come back. And the bad thing is they tell everybody else. That's the bad thing. They will not tell you that they told everybody else. It's just will tell you. So uh, certification is unbelievably important. What we did in Cancun was, was really great. They had 168 cooks and 40 supervisors and managers. If you go to a restaurant, 16 bars, you have to have this kind of When they pay much more less hourly wage than they pay here. So they can't afford to have many more people. Makes sense. Uh, so what they did there, we certified throughout those four weeks all people. Now, the certification is done by Chicago. That's a headquarter. So there's no certification on property that you fill out and sign there and give them the diploma, no, no, no. It has to be sent to the headquarter. They will certify it, they send it back, and everybody who passed will get their diploma, will get their certificate. Otherwise, it will not happen. Uh, Safe is, uh, is uh, translated, to my knowledge, now 25 languages. There's no other organization worldwide who can match those people. They're the best. Hands down, they're the best. Well, every five years, you have to be recertified. Managed. Now the COVID, I can uh, I can almost ensure you that everybody has to be treated with everybody. Because it's so important that people understand how they have the food and how they get sick. Sneeze cards are not enough. You have to have other, other things, uh, you know, that prevent you from getting sick. Uh, classroom training starts after we did this for a week. Uh, this doesn't, if, if the company would decide not to do this, then, okay, then we just do the hands on training and then uh, the coding training, that's fine. But most companies will always do this first, always. Because then you roll into the rest of it. So we do the classroom, and then we do hands on cooking. There are three, there are two sessions, uh, from, from 9 to 12, and from 1 to 4. So we try to pack the the, the sessions with many people as we can get. Of course, they have, cannot come because they have to cook, they have to work. Sometimes people come in a day off, they have to get paid for it. But the, those two are very, very instrumental days. Then you have the last day, then is the graduation day. And everybody hopefully not only gets his safe surf diploma, but might come two weeks later, but pretty much get an idea who passed or didn't pass. Because whoever facilitates the training, you know, and see already what's going on there. But the graduation is, is a big part. We give everybody a new diploma for the cooking efforts and for the classroom efforts so they can something hang on the wall. And then post assessment feedback with GM, chef, again, the day we leave or the day before we leave, we meet the channel manager, the meet director, and the chef, when chef's assessment, the feedback, what employees are saying about us, what management is saying about us. If you're effective, you're good, and that is, it's just a waste of money. This is more or less the way how it works with us. I say with us, as somebody else, we sometimes we join forces. Chef helping chefs is another organization. It's Chef and Rots, who's a good friend of mine. When we went to those two places together, because he didn't have anybody who spoke Spanish. So I spoke Spanish, so he just called me and said, you want to join me? I said, yeah, why not? Absolutely. We used to live there and we here. So this is more or less what we do when we go on consulting trips. Okay? They are very fun trips. Mostly it starts 7 in the morning and it's 5, 6 o'clock in the afternoon. And then many times, in my case, I still go on a walk through to the restaurants and keep an eye on them because they'll come and ask me, say, can you come by? Can you take a look? What do you think about our chicken? What's going on with the enchiladas? And when I do this, my wife, you know, sometimes she comes with me, not always. Seven. If she comes with me, she is away. Now, this here, this is something my grandfather always pounded into my head. This is something I do right away from the get-go when I talk about food. Something very, very simple. Okay, you don't need a scientist to understand this life. 
you know, you have three uh, food sources. It's the, the common food you buy, you know, what is genetically engineered already, 40%, that's what they say, but people don't know this. And then you have the organically, and then you have the GMOs, which is talked about, which for me is another time bomb. Playing Russian roulette, I'm telling you this. I'm telling you as a profession. This is all BS bullshit. What they do is not necessary. Fruits, vegetables in most countries in Latin America are rotten. They're not picked. It's just in Southeast Asia, same thing. They're not picked. So why do we want to you know, do, produce more food with, with uh, splicing genes and doing all this stuff, but, but in effect, we give us more diseases and more, more COVIDs and more AIDS and more etc. etc. So, why I bring this up, uh, I mean, the one who encouraged me to do this with was Peter, and Peter is in Brazil, and he's not here. Peter and I talked about this, and I just expanded it a little because I really believe in this. My, my grandfather, whenever I went on vacation, visit my grandparents, my grandfather was an old. First world, first world war and second world war veteran. So he was tough, like me, as he was disciplined, loving, but he couldn't show him as his tough. So what he did when I was sitting there, my grandmother was always trying to, to, to assist me because she knew what he would do with me. First of all, I had to sit straight back out. If not, he said to put a rule on it. But I mean, this guy was unbelievable sometimes. He didn't do it, but he was just so intense. He was in his late 80s or and then hunting to Austria and Switzerland, this guy. Unbelievable. So uh, he said to me, it's very important when you chew your food 36 times. 36 times. He did it 36 times, this guy. When you expect it from you, you do the same thing. Because that's the way when the food goes down there, nothing great has, has to happen down there anymore. I mean, it's digested already. You know, he was so methodically. Uh, explaining you why food has to be chewed for so many times. And so this, I think, is a little bit more extending to, you know, you have a focal sinner there, of course. You have many different types of uh, looks and smells and touches and tastes and hearings and a focal sinner in one dish. Now, in today's very, you know, rushed, society in time, we don't have any time. Fast food is our way to go. We don't eat with common sense anymore, which is shoved in. I'm one of them. You know, particularly I'm a chef. I don't take the time to sit down and eat. My father had this great thing going for him. He always sat down and took his time and ate the way it should be. So this is all this work. What I'd like to explain cooks or try to explain uh, customer, you know, that he should take the time, he should take advantage of the taste, you know, find out what the taste is all about. You know, when you eat some excellent good food with some chips, you know, crunchy. If they stay in, they're not really crunchy. And you have to make them crunchy or they have to get new chips. Because that's the way it works. Touch, you know, one one old rule when you touch a, a steak. Rare, rare, medium, well done. You know, you can't do this, and it works. Touch the steak and touch this, it works, it works. I would say. You don't have to stick the thing in there and look what it says, and then the juice comes out, and you quite want to do this. I mean, if you're not in the profession, you know how to cook, then you do those kinds of things. Uh, so this more or less is encompasses a little bit the science of food, the, the senses of food, the senses of eating. And this is, again, going back to Sager's training, uh, very, very important. And those are all the steps until you get to a conservative It's a great, great program. I mean, some of the rest of the food industry, I am sure he has been faced with this year because uh, if you have not, then it's time to do so. Because you will be facing all those new laws now, or they will kill you if you don't know what to do with it. Uh, this year, this is the stuff you have in our training manual. Okay? This is all in Spanish now, okay? I posted in Spanish, we have it in English and in Spanish. I translated it soon as And it's not just going on Google and translate it on Google, it doesn't work. I mean, you can translate certain things on Google, but when it comes to technical terms, you have to be careful. You might exclude what's happened to me twice. Yeah? One minute? 
Okay, one minute. Uh, the recipes, you know, that's the, the method how we present recipes, we post the recipes. Now we are not posting so much paper stuff anymore in what environment, you know. You have a computer screen there, you can read the recipe there on the station. So no big deal. Uh, we have a schedule there, you know, also in two languages. And then we have the 15 minute training, and then we have our whiteboard. The whiteboard for me is the great information center. Everybody meets in the morning, everybody meets at night then. That's the Marriott thing. You know, you have things, you have endings, things you have results, and things that are When you go over this every day, but there has to be no days where you don't have stuff result. For example, you have a push list and the entrance of the story. Everybody has to take an item before it leaves the store or the push list. Or make something out of it. You rotate those. Days on hand, four days, that's what you should have. Uh, and that's, I think the, the weekly schedule and then more and less, there are many more stuff. This is kitchen schematics, it also help you in setting up the kitchen. Stoves and ovens where you want to have them, how you should look. You have now programs on the internet that are fantastic. You know, they, they give you everything. You just put it in there and they come up with it. Yeah, that's my information. Go and uh, go on my website. It's a huge website. Absolutely big, many people say, but there's a lot of information on there. All those videos about my trips around the world, they're all on there. I filmed them personally. I edited them. I did the whole thing. I learned this 50 years ago in Mexico. I had those little two wheelers, you know, came to the screen, and then I cut them and I pasted them. Today is on digital. You don't have to worry about them. You go on your computer to do something. So, uh, any questions? So, I'm curious, are you doing this for large corporations? I do this for anybody who needs my services. Anybody who would say, uh, let's sit down, let's find out what you need, what you have to offer. Okay. If they're on big companies, big hotels, or anything. Fifty-nine rooms, thousand rooms. Obviously, this is pretty involved. How long does this normally take to do? For let's say you're doing a resort. Uh, with the, the consulting? Yes. Uh, I would say four weeks. Sometimes they do two weeks, but they always go back to four weeks. How do you find your possible places to do this? They seek you out. Mostly they have seek. Seek me out. I mean, very, very honestly, I had not to look for a job. But well, that's not why I'm here for. I just want to tell you. I'm here for that you remember my name, that you remember my company. There are big things in works right now, but uh, the main reason is for me to introduce myself. That's very important. That's wonderful. Little back here. Sure. Yeah. So. When you offer your services, you get your you get your name now. No, 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 when you when you offer your services, do you base it on the recipes of the person that's reaching out to you, or your own recipes? They tell me what they want. I listen. I don't talk. I just listen. They tell me, Mr. Miller, we need this and this and this and this and this. We have too much turnover. Oh, so the people are not motivated. So what we should do? I tell you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Easy, that's not very difficult. I mean, because if you have the kind of experience I have, travel around the world, work with so many different nationalities, I feel always welcome wherever I go. Southeast Asia, Middle East, I don't care. They're all the same people, they all have the same thing. Very, very, very good, my friend. Uh, good morning. <laughs> Got it right this week, right? Uh, uh, this is one of the best presentations I've ever seen. If you want to be an entrepreneur, you just saw what it takes to do it because everything is done properly there. I want to say this your website on the bottom is what you're going to have to use your. Uh, and this is not working. Uh, no, I know. It's working with some phones, it's not working yeah. with others. I don't know why. That's why I put this underneath. Uh, my grandson and I, he's an expert, he may not see it. But if for some reason it's, it doesn't work, you know. So that's why I put my website. The website entails everything you want to know about me. So are you only 
a person doing the training, or do you it's have all, it's all depend. If it's uh, if it entails the the safe sort of training, then we have other people mentioned. If it's just purely consulting, uh, hands on cooking, cooking classes, I think you. I know it was a bad experience for you, but is that why? Did you notice on your thing it says Gaylord Sums? Yeah. Oh, you say that? Yeah. I had to correct this. I didn't even see this. I had to the price of the whole way. No, I mean, Gaylord is a very strange experience, you know, but the. When I think back, I mean, it's magnificent hotel, I mean, wrong. But it's not a hotel, it's the people who work there. That's the most important thing. You know, the, 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 the executive committee is very important, the management in general is very important. The World Center, the Marathon Lander World Center, had the most fabulous management team. I worked in about 50 plus years. Fabulous. They were fantastic people. They could go home with you. Probably the That's how good they were. Great presentation. One thing I don't know whether people don't understand what you said. As the food is unique, all starts on the sight, smell, the five senses. It all starts here. Then once you go down below, you have no clue whether you ate a hot dog or ice cream. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Check it out. That's all. The, the first thing you do, at least it's happened to me, I don't know, if you sit in a restaurant, don't you watch the radar and then come into the train? I mean, I see, you know, there was the season 52. Somebody know what she's yeah, season 52? Yeah, yeah. Taylor and the 12 were 15 years ago. They had this one item, this one Caesar salad, whatever it was. A big cylinder that was plastic, it was not glass. There came on the plane, a white plane, the cylinder was full with salad. So they came, and I was wondering what they want with the cylinder there. I mean, and then they lift up the cellar very slow, the cylinder. And the cellar just came down. I mean, it was just something you remember. I still remember this. One little thing. It was just a cellar. But it was a cylinder. But we got people moving. Everybody talked about it. You know, they came in on the plate, like three cylinders there. Nobody knew what they were doing with the thing. Fantastic. Yeah. Now I look at the mini, there are any of those kind of things anymore. <laughs> smell is so important. Without smell, you don't have any hands on coming out. Without that, all cardboard. You won't taste it. But even the new food, uh, you know, even the bush. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is uh, Surfside? Is there another entity out there? Oh yeah, okay. so, I think I put down. Did I, did I uh, mention underneath that? Yeah. yeah. This is the state wide uh, Florida State Certification would be Safe Staff. Mm. That's like Safe Surf. Okay, that's in Florida. It's very same. It's almost the same thing. I wanted to bring a booklet to show you this, but unfortunately I couldn't find this booklet. You know, study guide. You know, this almost the same thing. In the state of Florida, everybody has to be certified. First thing the, 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 the health inspector does when he comes to the public, he doesn't call anybody, doesn't say anything, he just walks in there. He can't walk in there anywhere, it's like the police are likely to be like that. Has his badge hanging here, you know, goes to the chef's office and wants to see all certifications. First thing he does. But then if he doesn't see all the certification, then he gives you a warning. The next time you don't have it, then you get fined. Up to two thousand dollars. So it is. So this this is uh, I appreciate you talking about food as an experience, because I'm definitely the guilty one that eats very fast. Super I, like, I take first and second place when I go to eat. It's crazy. I make people cry. So uh, what's next for you? What uh, you you know, what, I, what I really want to do, that's what I said before, I want that you keep my name, and keep my company's name, and if you come across any major companies that are interested to manage a $100 million business, I've written a business plan. Who knows, down the road, I might be giving you a chance to make a presentation of my business plan, if I about this particular project, the name of the project is the Kitchen Forum, the Hub. So the people come meet, 
is around 450,000 square feet. It's huge. If uh, going off of that, and if you're looking at giving this presentation, I'm going to I'm going to give you some presentation feedback. Okay. Um, if you're looking at giving this presentation to further your business, um, what I'm going to suggest is you spend more time on what your business is and what you're what you're doing. Uh, the, the, your 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 backstory and your history is very very important. However, if you're pitching your business, the the story about what your business is doing, what it can do to uh, to help uh, those that you're pitching to, is more important. Yeah, absolutely. I could have added on so many slides, but you know, eight minutes, seven minutes, I went over clearly. What is it? Twenty minutes? Twenty minutes? I, I could talk. I have pictures. I have stuff to entertain you for hours. I'm telling you, she would not leave. And, 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 and something else that, that I noticed and that has been uh, um, brought to us by our folks online is they were able to hear you. And part of the reason is during a lot of your presentation, you were speaking to the people in the front row. Right. That's, yeah. And when you're when you're giving a presentation to a large audience, you have audience, to speak to everybody. Speak to the center a of the room. Absolutely. And that, that, that Good point. Out. But. Um, but, but concentrating more on what you're wanting uh, for the business and what you're presenting, you know, what, what, what you're offering to uh, those that you're, you're hoping to get from. Uh, you, you know, the, the, the slide here, for example, you know, pretty much explains here, okay, we can broaden this and give you another three or four slides in our talk. Yeah, that's. That's what we want to you hear. You know, all those kind of things here. Yeah, I mean, it takes another 10 minutes to walk you through because those are real things. I believe in it. We're doing those things. And we're not only practicing, we're implementing those kind of things. So my job as a consultant is, and I believe this very strongly in all those years, is more listening than talking. Yep. Because if I start talking about all this stuff and don't listen to the customer, they are not that I listen. Once I have listened, then I can make up my mind and tell them what you can offer. That always works. Always. If you start talking over and being so concerned about what you are, what you can provide, they might not need all this. They're not interested. They're interested in just motivating your people or doing a couple of hands off things. Well taken, well taken, your criticism. Well taken, absolutely. I'm not doing this every day, don't forget. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's always a new world when you stay here. There are only new people, new faces, some groups in the right, some groups in the left, you know. What do you want? Um, very interesting presentation, thank you. I have two questions. The first one is, um, as a professional, um, can you count five um, items, okay? five points, um, putting health, I mean, in terms of health, um, what are the criteria because of which you wouldn't eat in the restaurant or anywhere else? In, ter in terms of health, this is the first question. We, we only have time for one. One <laughs> question. One okay. one. So, so in, what do you mean? That health reasons? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you go to the restaurant, and I want you to, to, you, I want you to tell me what yeah. are the five items which you would count today because of which you wouldn't eat. In the uh, services, number one. No, not management. I mean, health reasons. Well, 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 health reasons. Health reasons yeah. uh, they have they no, sell it for There are no recipes in place. There is no uh, guidance, no directions by management. You can see the side of it, how they walk around. You can see how the cooks work, how they use their hands. Yes, number one. Hands. Okay. Yeah. Number two. Uh, I think uh, body language. Body language. I think it's, it's always very important. If somebody is a professional, he has the body language. Otherwise, Motivation. You have to be motivated. There has to be incentive why you come to work. I don't care what you do. If you don't have an incentive, when the chef cannot provide you those incentives, then there's something wrong with the chef under you. It's always the same thing, believe me, wherever you go. People want to be efficient. Read my business card. I printed those business cards just for you guys today. You know this? Read what it says in the back there. It says uh, the biggest blame in human nature is to be efficient. William James. We're no running out of time. I'm sorry, okay. uh, Josh. All right, so our, our famous uh, final question is, what can we as a community do to help you? 
Right. You know, this is for me a way. I mean, I'm so happy I did this. I mean, I was looking forward to the full beach. I was swimming it. I was eating it. I was <laughs> eating it. I swear to you, I take things very, very serious, don't I? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody was. <laughs> so I'm very intense and very, very, very intense, and I believe in my dreams. Uh, listen, can you give me this, bring the, this little thing in my back there, this little saying? I want to show you, it's very quick. It fell off my mental, so I want to bring it in. Bring it in there, very quick. Oh, my grandson, this is uh, my two elves. You know? <laughs> they're helping me, they're there for me, and they're supporting me. We worked very hard the last 24 hours and 10 minutes. I mean, what I want to show you this thing hangs on my door, this fell down. You got it? You got it? No, 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 no. I hope he doesn't go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know that's the first that, that somebody did what I just did. You know, just leaving here in the bathroom. No, I, I don't know where I left it right now. Uh, it says uh, when, uh, when you have dreams, and you believe in your dreams, you have to pay the price to make them come true. It says in my office, it hangs there every morning, I go in there, I look at the thing. Now it fell down, so I have to paste it back on there. I believe in this wholeheartedly. There's no plan B. Please, no plan B. Plan A! Ask Arnold. Arnold Schwarzenegger will tell you this. Okay? Well, I believe in hard soul like I'm not this. You have to go out there and have to fight for it. You know that's why I stay here. I'm not offering my wife, my 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 soul and my life here. Right now. I'm just telling you, if I meet somebody and I meet somebody again and again, I will do any effort, any single go on my way to do so. That's why I showed up today. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. So does anybody know the Radio Lab podcast? Heard of it, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, I listen to it on the weekends. So I was listening <clears throat> a few weeks ago, and they they were telling a story about three dendrochronologists. These are people who count tree rings. And they were at a dendrochronology conference because there is such a thing. And there are 200 people at the conference because that's probably how many there are. And three of them were out for drinks after one evening at the conference. A guy from Idaho who counts tree rings in the Keys, the Florida Keys, not the Idaho Keys. A woman in Tucson where there are not a lot of trees. And a woman who counts tree rings of shipwrecks. And through a conversation, the guy from Idaho t measuring Florida finds that there are some trees with no rings. And they figure out, or, or very, very thin rings, they figure out these are hurricanes. Hurricanes have caused these trees to not have a ring that year. You know, a ring, one ring per year, and the ring will vary based on fires and insects and uh, good years and bad years based on weather. And, <clears throat> and they figure out these are hurricanes. And the, the woman says... Uh, the woman who, who measures the shipwrecks and counts those, she says, you know, there are Spanish records that go back to 1492 that, that detail all of the ships that are lost and the reasons why they are lost. Storms, pirates, what have you. And they, they combine their knowledge and, and are able to take what NOAA, the National uh, Oceanic Atmospheric uh, Agency, uh, has gone back 150 years to 1851 to all the tracked hurricanes. Well, taking what the Idaho guy has done and the shipwreck woman have done, has done, they triple the amount of hurricane knowledge that NOAA can use. Right? They go back to 1492 to know when all of these other hurricanes happened, and they're able to confirm all of this. Just because, just because the three of them got together for drinks, happened to be talking about this one thing. And so, you know, out of what, 7 billion people in the world, out of 200 dendrochronologists, 
they find each other and they add to a body of knowledge you're missing the best part i'm sorry you're leaving i know no really i'm kidding it's ok it's every wednesday every wednesday eight thirty this is my first one i had a colleague invite me and he said you'd love it and it's well good and thank you for coming thank you sorry no great presentation i have all your information actually all right now i'm going to tell you where the treasure's buried bye but no actually the treasure really is the fact that these three people happen to get together and just the serendipity of the meeting they just happen to meet at the conference they just happen to go out for drinks and this guy from idaho just happened to mention this puzzle he was working with to two people he had just met and they tripled the amount of hurricane knowledge that the the noah has and so what what that really inspired me to talk about here today was the fact that you meet people who share some of the same interests as you, whether it's entrepreneurship and small business ownership, or you come from the same area of the world, or you're in the same industry, or you used to be in the same industry, or you have allied industries that the two of you work together. You talk to the same people. And so the serendipity of meeting people here today and connecting with them and going out for drinks or going out for coffee or going out for lunch and collaborating on something that nobody has ever done before. Nobody ever put the idea of tree rings and shipwrecks together until that day. And so you and the people you are meeting, you can put an idea together and come up with something brand new that nobody else has ever done. And it happens because you're here each week engaging and connecting. So you met somebody out here today or you're about to meet somebody in the next 30 minutes as we close, please get together, have coffee, have lunch, start sharing ideas, share problems that you are working uh, on, problems that you are having trouble with, and the other person may have the solution that nobody in the world has ever thought of. That happens because you're here. So I'm glad you are. Uh, we do have a quick announcement. I made this special slide. Deja, what is our announcement? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'll try to make this quick. Um, good morning. As some of you may know, I have been kind of behind the scenes working on a event business, putting on networking experiences, events to you know connect with entrepreneurial um, entrepreneurs in our community. And I am sorry. I am uh, very proud to. Uh, there we go. Hey. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, now I'm actually proud. Um, <laughs> No, but I'm very proud to invite you all to uh, my first experience or event uh, next Thursday at Freedom Conduit. Um, it starts at 6.30. It is a networking event, um, a special networking event to celebrate a local startup that we have in our community. They're called Career Scoops. I mean, speaking of serendipitous meetings and you know, never knowing who you're going to partner with or collaborate with, they're one of those success stories, got together, idea, and now they're launching their um, very first crowdfunding campaign. And so they're putting on this big party for everyone. It's themed like grown up ice cream social. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Um, and if you're looking to connect, maybe experience something different, but also talk to other entrepreneurs and founders and investors, this event is for you. Um, the event is called the First Scoop. So if you go on Google, you can Google first, the First Scoop event, and it will pop up there. Um, like I said, it's an ice cream social networking event. Hope you'll come out and enjoy a good time with us. All right. Yeah, Thank you. Um, for those of you on Zoom, uh, if you'd like to download the chat, click the three button or the three dots at the bottom right of the screen, and it'll say "Save Chat." Uh, and for the rest of you, if you want a copy of it, there's not much going on, but if you want a copy of it, email me, uh, and I will send it to you. Join us on Meetup.com. And like I just said, connect with somebody, meet somebody, go have coffee with somebody that's going to grow your business. Uh, don't forget your parking pass. If you park in the truest garage across the street, there's a parking pass that gets you out for free on the on the corner of the coffee station. Hopefully so, this week there's an attendant, because last week the guy went on break or something and couldn't get out. Say, oh, really? Uh, I was going to say, how do we give them our noise ever there? I mean, I know that on one side it's open, but there's like a lot of people. They usually are. Last week was an exception. I didn't see the person there, but 
They, they usually are interactive. The other method is you back your car up about 20 yards and stomp on the gas. <laughs> yeah. I just want the second story if I can. Keep in mind also, you don't have to turn that pass in. You can keep it. It's good for everything. Yeah. Not that we're advocating taking a pass that you get for another free event. We are not telling you to do that. We're not telling you not to. <laughs> so thank you all for coming, and we will see you next week.